Okay, welcome everyone. It's time to get started. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's topic for the MOOC is naming conventions and test case structures. We're so glad that you're here with us to listen in and learn about this because it's a very important topic to us and I'm glad that um, the rest of you also believe that it is important. So over the next hour, we're going to spend time going into naming conventions, have some tips and test case structures and um, our recommendations for these topics. So my name's Melissa and I'm one of your hosts. Also here with me is Sarah Romero and Frank Meeklish. Hi. Hi. And we're going to be presenting today um, the topics that we will be covering will be naming elements uh, clearly for all users, focusing on working in a multi-user environment, um, organizing your elements, and Tricentis recommended test case structures. So sit back, relax, you won't need to have Tosca open for this. Um, you can just follow along and there will be a recording of this session so you can always reference back to us um, to see what we covered. So if you're joining us for the first time with one of our, um, for this MOOC, again I want to say welcome and a MOOC, what we're offering here at Tricentis from the Academy, these are massive open online courses. So these sessions we're going to be doing about every week or so. Um, we've got three more coming up. We already had a couple recently. Some of you may have joined us. Um, and these open online courses are just covering different topics within Tosca. And at the end, we're going to have time for Q&A. So please keep track of your questions. You can answer them into the question box. And Frank is here to help us out as we're presenting to answer all your questions. And then again, we can demonstrate things at the end during the Q&A session. So, um, if this is the first time you're joining, I just want to let you know what to expect. Um, we always start and finish our MOOCs right on time, even if people are joining in late. Um, there's always the recording if people want to look at things that they missed. Um, there's time for the Q&A box, the Q&A session. Um, your computers are muted. If you need to communicate with us, just enter it into the box there. And for the Q&A time, please keep your questions on topic. And today, that's definitely naming conventions and test case structures. So that's what we'll be focusing on. If you have additional questions, we have um, some context for you at the end if you need to open support tickets and that sort of thing. If you have specific questions for your projects, we won't be covering them today. So I guess we'll get started. Yeah, here we go. So the first thing we want to bring up is having a, have a naming convention. This is super important because every company is going to have a different naming convention. However, it's important to get started with one. Know what is clear for you and clear for your testers. So this is pro probably a topic that's really important for test managers or project leads who are going to be coming up with this. And it's also important for the testers as they create elements within Tosca and they need to know how am I going to be naming these things and what is going to be clear for all users as we're all working on the same project in a multi-user environment. So today we'll go through some examples of um, how teams may choose to name their elements and some more suggestions and best practices. And the advice that we have today, you can either take it or it may inspire you, but definitely come up with your own and do what works for you based on your company and your projects. So here's an example of one project. I wanted to show you a couple examples of how this one project took uh, the naming convention into play and they named some of their elements. To look at a project, looking at the component folder and everything within it, you have a great overview of what's inside. And if you could look at this and see tons and tons of modules and test steps and test cases, it might be quite long. You have no idea how many things are in there, but to have a great overview, you can organize things into folders. And so here in one overview, we have everything in front of us and we can see where things are, what they're named and how to find things right when we need them. And that's visible for everybody on the project, which is greatly important. So under requirements, you can see with this, So with this project, there are two requirement sets here at the top. There's um, the first requirement set is going to contain everything 
for the initial implementation. I can tell that just from the name. And then the next requirement set is everything for the backlog. So that's not 50 requirement sets containing one requirement each. It's only two and they're categorized. If you move down to test cases, what I'm going to go into today is what does it mean to have items for a folder approved, ready for approval, in work, duplicates, etc. So these test cases within this project here are organized within these categories. What state are the test cases currently in? And as the state changes, the items can move from folder to folder. So it's always up to date. If you look down on modules, the orange folders there, again, the same folder structure, the same names were used, approved, ready for approval, in work, rejected. So that would be a great overview. That's a great example of how to arrange your modules by their category and by their current status. And Sarah here would like to just mention one thing about the execution list as well. Um, okay, so you can also see the execution list uh, section, so that's the green section here, does look, the structure looks a little bit different than um, the test cases or the module section. So rather than uh, in work, ready, or approved, so status-based folders, um, we have uh, one execution list called approved test cases. And the rationale behind this is kind of self-explanatory, and that's that um, once a test case is approved, I don't have to then create different um, uh, level, levels of status for my execution list. I'm not going to have in-work execution list. I'll only execute finalized and approved test cases. So I'll only have... Oh, okay, I'm, I'm getting a message that I've lost audio. Um, maybe quickly, if you can hear me, uh, mention that in the yeah, question box. Yeah, back. Oh, okay, so I've gotten audio back, so I can keep going. Okay, thank you guys for that quick feedback. Um, <clears throat> all right, so uh, just in case you missed that, um, with the execution lists, you can see that the structure of this green section, the execution list section, um, is a little bit different than uh, the modules or the test cases. Uh, the reason for that is, as I said, a little bit um, self-explanatory, hopefully, um, and that's because you will only be running or you'll be only executing finalized and approved test cases because as you guys should know, um, working in Tosca, if you are trying to test, um, test uh, in work or ready for approval test cases, um, you can always run them in the scratch book as a preliminary test. Um, and then uh, the final execution is only for the approved test cases. Um, so you can see here that I only have one approved test cases execution list. Um, and then there are a couple other folders, um, and that's just if you want to create separate batches of executions of um, test cases. So for example, um, I'll just look at one of them real quickly. Um, I have all approved test cases here in this execution list, um, but I have an execution list folder called tester execution. And this could be where I could create something called test mandates. And I won't get too into detail with that because that would be covered when um, we uh, go over in detail execution um, lists. But uh, what you could do, for example, in this test case, uh, in this um, folder, is create separate batches or groups of, of execution lists, um, which should be run by specific users. So let's say Melissa would get 10 of the test cases out of, let's say, 100. I would get 10 test cases assigned to us. We could execute them. And then the results um, from these executions would show up under the approved test cases um, so that you could see um, we could each run them separately. So in a multi-user environment, we could check out our separate mandates, run them, and then the results would show up um, in, our, uh, in the overall execution list section. Okay, so we are going to go into Tosca and show you um, some more examples of this. I know that just looking at one image, one project, might not give you the best overview of what this really would be like for you. Um, but I'm going to go into a couple terms, or a couple of the folders that actually repeat um, 
And if you are taking notes or if you would be an admin in a project coming up with the naming convention, you might want to just keep these in mind. These are very important folders. They really help you with the, the broad overview of your project. So if you had a folder for approved, this could be test cases, this could be modules, this, as an admin, you could set to be only used by test approval and design user group within a multi-user environment. So as an admin, you can set permissions for each of the different elements or folders or trees um, to be visible by different users. So approved would be only visible or accessible and used by a certain user group, which is determined by the admin. The next folder, which is great to use um, as an initial folder, is ready for approval. And this would be used by everybody. Once the object is ready to be approved, it goes in here, and then um, a manager or, or lead or the appropriate person would then approve that and move it into the other folder. The next one is in work, which is also used by everybody. This is the beginning when you're first creating a module, when you're first creating a test case. Um, before it's finished. So it's planned, it's in worked, and it's not ready yet. So this is during the creation phase. Rejected could be another useful folder to have if a module has been already created and ready for approval, but then it wasn't approved, it was rejected. So something might be missing, it might need a little bit more work, and you can keep track of that and just have it separate until it's fixed and ready to move on. So here's another example. I just want to expand the approved test cases, ready for approval test cases, and focus on this for a minute. If I were to have a project and I had multiple testers working on it, this is a great example of how to name the next set of folders. You could name it if it's ready for approval, ready, and then the, the tester's name. So this would be accessible by that per that person um, set by the permissions, and that would be where they're working, ready for approval or in work. You could do the same thing and have the person's name who's creating that. And then once it is finished and approved, it could be moved up into the approved test cases folder according to its category. So that would be determined based on your system under test and how you arrange your project. So that's another good example. Just It's great to know who's working on it and that person who's working on their test cases would be the one to set the work state, actually, on each of the test cases. We'll show you that in Tosca. There's a column where you can set everything that you're working on, the test cases, from planned, in work, uh, and completed. And it's the person who's creating that who's going to understand what state it is in because they're making it. So they're the ones that set that. Right. Okay. One moment, I'm going to go into Tosca and show you just a couple more examples of how some, some things can be named. So let's have a look at our test cases, our modules, and our requirements. So this is another example of a project. If you've taken a course with us, this is based off of um, Automation Specialist 1, Level 1. So this is a course all about automation, um, testing the demo web shop, which you would be familiar with if you've taken a course with us. And you may have seen it if you joined a, a MOOC in the past, and you'll see a little bit of it today. So here in our test cases section, an example of what this may be set up like would be this. You have your approved test cases, ready for approval test cases, and in work test cases. So in this project, no test cases have been approved yet. One is ready for approval. <coughs> Excuse me. And many testers are working on in-work test cases. So let's have a look at in, uh, in here for ready for approval test cases. So this folder would be mine. I have ready Melissa C. We can expand this. I have one folder within, and that's because I'm working on the requirement calculate shipping cost. Say, for instance, my task was to create the test cases required to calculate the shipping cost. Um, which is a requirement of our system under test. The demo web shop, if you're unfamiliar, is an online store. 
so you can go on purchase items and it's just used for testing and um, automating and finishing our courses and stuff like that so you can have a yeah you can test it out so that would be one requirement of our system under test calculate shipping costs and within here I have one test case this test case actually you can see here I've marked it as completed so it's ready for approval someone needs to approve that and then it would be moved up to approved and so because this one is finished let's see if it runs actually So I did was I pressed F6 and actually it's on the, let me see if I can show, there I'm trying to show it, it's, it's running here, you should be able to see it on the screen, I pressed F6 which runs the test case and it's using the scratch book. So right now this is a preliminary test. Um, it's not going to save the results. It's just going to show me, did it pass? Did it fail? Okay, let's go back into Tosca. My scratch book. And I'm going to be able to see that I ran this test case and all of my steps within the test case, which you can see here if I expand the test case all the way. These are all my steps and all my values, which that might be a little overwhelming too at the moment, but we are going to get into that next week, creating a full test case and setting the values, etc. But just to show you what happened is everything, this is a fully automated test case. And so when I ran it, it, it ran in the web shop and everything was successfully passed. So that's what these green check marks are. And you could have seen that in the demo web shop, going through the store, um, purchasing something, adding it to the um, to the shopping cart, checking out, logging in, logging out, that sort of thing. But we'll go back into that in a little bit when we're covering test cases. So that's how these items are organized. It's very clear. Let's have a look at the modules. You can see again as the overview we have approved, ready for approval, in work, and rejected. And let's have a look into the approved modules. In this case let's just say everything has been approved. I can right click on this and open it in its own folder. These are all the modules for the web shop. <coughs> so let's see some of the names for what a module would be. When you're choosing how to name your module, what's important is modules can be used for a number of different things. They're reused, reused, reused. That's one of their awesome benefits. So it's not all about this you know, this particular module is used to do this or this or this, A, B, or C. It needs to be named based on its contents. It needs to be named based on what's inside of it. So in this case, we have our own folder for one module, which is the top menu. That's because it only contains the top menu, which if we expand this, if you're familiar with the demo web shop, you would know that that's the login page, the login link, these four buttons up top. And then if we go down, we've categorized under customer some more modules. We have the register page, register completed page, which would show up after somebody has registered a user into the store. And then next under the folder products, we have some products. So this is going to be, um, you can see some of these are named after the exercise in the course that they're from, but still they're under the, the folder products. So this would be all the apparel and shoes, um, this would be digital download, that's a different, different grouping of products. So these modules, if I need to navigate to one of these items, that would be the module that I use in my test step. So they're very clearly named, and that's basically the point I want to get across when I'm showing you this right here. And just real quickly, I'm going to open the requirements for this as well and just show you how these items are named. So for this project, we have a web shop back end and web shop front end. So those are the two requirement sets. And in a couple weeks, we're going to be doing a MOOC all about the requirement section. So you'll get to know all of this if you're unfamiliar with it. It's just a little bit of an introduction, I'd say. So let's focus on this one requirement set, web shop front end. 
If we expand all of these, we'll see the requirements within them. But these main requirements categorize, there's customer tasks, handle products, shopping cart, and order process. And then within each one of those sections of the web shop, there are specific requirements. What is the system under test expected to do? What is it required to do? And these have been specified here. So not looking into all of the details here, we just want to look at the names. They're very clear requirements, register, add products, um, calculate shipping costs. We want to test each one of these requirements and make sure that they work. So that's an example of how some things are named in Tosca. Okay, um, <clears throat> so uh, thank you, Melissa. Sarah here again. Um, I'm going to now talk to you a little bit um, more specifically about test case structure. Um, so this is now moving a little bit away from uh, naming conventions, uh, which Melissa was talking about, and I really want to talk about how you set up a test case in the test case section. We won't be actually automating in this session. We'll do that um, next week. Um, but before automating, um, sometimes people just want to, you know, jump in, start uh, creating test steps, putting in values um, without putting a lot of thought into how they're actually structuring the test case itself. Um, so we want to make sure that we give you um, a little bit more insight into the test case section. And um, in the test case section, um, if you've already done a little bit of automation or worked in this blue section, um, you may have noticed that there's a couple different types of folders and um, there's test cases, test steps, and you might be a little bit confused about which are which, when do you use which one, what are they used for. Um, so that's the main goal of the next few minutes. Um, so on the left, um, you see there's two folder symbols. Um, on the left, you see a lighter blue folder. Um, this is a test case folder. And this is really just used, um, it's really just a structural element. So a test case folder um, is used to organize the test case section, um, like Melissa showed you um, uh, in the in work section of test cases, you might have different test case folders for different users. Um, and that means that that user's test cases will all be grouped into each of those folders. Okay, so that is easy enough. So within the light blue folder, so within this light blue folder, you will be creating your test cases. So step one, organize it structurally, put the test case folders in. Um, step two would be to actually add the test cases, okay? So before you start adding any uh, modules over, dragging anything over, you want to actually create a test case and name it. Um, and the name, of course, should relate to um, whatever its um, particular um, requirement or whatever the, the focus of the test case is. Sorry, the focus of the test case um, should be reflected in the name. And within the test case, um, you will have test steps. And the test steps tell Tosca how to navigate through the system under test. And those test steps should also be structured. So instead of having 500 steps clicking through an application, you should have folders which organize the test steps so that a, someone who goes to, um, let's say, work on, approve, adjust your test case can quickly see what the structure is without having to go through every step. And those um, structural elements are the test step folders. So that's the darker blue folder on the right. Um, and the one additional uh, element in this section I want to talk about before I go right into Tosca um, are test configuration parameters. So here that's abbreviated as TCP, but that's test configuration parameter. Um, and these are uh, predefined values or um, parameters. Um, which uh, specify the conditions or the, the um, way that the test case should be run. Um, so that could be on a particular system, um, in a particular environment. Um, so we would specify, for example, the browser, which browser this test case should be run in. Okay, so I would, that's, now I'm setting up the structure of the test case and defining how and under what conditions it should be run. Um, and now I'm going to go ahead and 
uh, jump into Tosca and I'll show you um, what I'm talking about. So we'll build a test case together. All right. So I'm going to go to the blue section, the test cases section. And um, Melissa already showed you that there are in work folders, so for each user. So I'm Sarah, and I'm going to be creating um, a test case or a set of test cases, let's say. Um, so of course, if I was in a multi-user environment, um, I would have to, let's say there were a couple of items inside this folder, um, I would have to check out um, this folder or the tree if there were additional elements under it that I needed to use um, so that I could make modifications to my particular folder. So the real benefit of organizing these by person is that uh, each person can check out their folder and work on their test cases without affecting anyone else's work. Okay, so um, the first step I told you is I want to create um, a folder. So for example, uh, let's say I will have two sets of test cases. So maybe I'll have um, shipping costs test cases and also uh, discount codes test cases. So I'm right clicking and selecting create folder. Um, you can also do control NF um, and that also is create new folder. Okay, oops, codes. Um, so these are the test case folders, and as you can see, they're really structural. They're just meant to give um, added levels of uh, detail in the project. Um, so let's say I'm working in the discount codes um, test case folder, and in here now, next step is to actually create test cases. So I, again, right-click. It's the same process in the whole section. It's always right-click, and then you can see which elements you're able to add on this level. Um, if I wanted to add one additional level of organization, I could create more folders. I want to instead already add a test case, so I can click on Create Test Case, which is this little blue arrow. Okay, and you can see the symbol now is a little bit different, and this is my test case. I can call this um, uh, shipping cost discount, let's say. So we have um, a few different discount codes uh, that you can use. So um, when you purchase products in our sample web shop, there are five, six different discount codes that could be applied, which deduct some of the cost from different uh, elements. So let's say I have a shipping cost discount test case, and also I want to create a uh, percent discount. Okay, so um, just a couple different, so all, these are all the test cases that refer to discount codes that I'm responsible for creating now, okay? Um, so now that I have a test case, you see, um, when I focus on it over here, that I have the work state planned, so I'm looking at my uh, shipping cost discount, um, and the work state is planned. Now that I've started working on it, I can set it to in work. And you can see the symbol changes, okay? Um, and now I'm going to start adding elements to this test case. The first thing I wanna do, as I said, is to structure it using test step folders. Um, and there is the best practice for structuring all test cases is to have three main test step folders um, so I will right click and create folder and you can see now this is the dark blue folder and the first will be precondition so those are all the steps required for setting up my um, system under test uh, to get it to the real workflow or the real process so for example the web shop logging in okay so the precondition of doing anything in the web shop is logging in, and so my precondition here will include the steps required to log in. Then I will have a third folder called workflow or process, and these will 
this will include all steps required to, these are all of the steps that um, uh, work through the system under test uh, to achieve the final verification or the main focus of the test case. And the last folder is post condition. And these, this folder um, contains all of the steps required to get the system under test back to the same work state, the same um, state that it was when I started. So I want the precondition and post condition to start and end at the same place or in the same state so that I can run multiple test cases one after the other. Um, and they, I won't have to do anything manually to readjust the system in between. So what I mean by that is, um, in the precondition, if I'm opening the application and logging in, then the post condition is logging out and closing the application. Okay? So that way, everything's closed at the end of a test case, and when the next one would start, it would be able to open it and log in. Okay, and then they would all be able to run in an execution list, let's say overnight, um, without anyone manually having to close the application or manually um, reopen it. Okay, um, in the workflow folder, of course, you probably already thought to yourself that workflow is a very general term, and if I have a very long test case or a complex test case, um, then this may not be much information for someone who's looking at the test case. So you would be right if you thought that, and it might make sense to add additional um, structural elements or test step folders to the workflow folder um, just to give it a more organized um, uh, flow. So I'm going to go ahead and um, add a few more of those folders. Um, and they're going to walk through the process of um, the shopping of the web shop. So I already said the precondition would be opening the web shop and logging in. Um, and then in the workflow, after I've logged in, I want to uh, order my product. So whatever the product is, okay? Because in order to check if I can apply a discount to an order, I have to have an order. Um, I would also have the start checkout, okay? So that will be probably where I then have added an item to my shopping cart, so now I want to go to the shopping cart. Um, and that's where I will uh, apply my discount. Then I will have another folder called um, the checkout process, and this is now just clicking through um, as a user would um, payment method, shipment method, you know, everything required to get to the final uh, total of your order. Um, and then I will have a verify discount folder. So this is now um, the actual focus of the test case, I, and that is why I want to add it separately, because, of course, the discount being calculated is part of the checkout process, um, when I receive that total amount, I will see also whether or not the discount has been added, but I want to separate, that's best practices as well, you want to separate the verify um, test step, and that is to make it clearer, that's the focus, you want to have a separate step for the focus of the test case. And um, the last thing before um, logging out would be confirming the order. Okay, so now I have the basic structure of the test case itself. Um, let's say now I would want to actually populate it with um, test steps. So now I've created test step folders and inside of them I want to have the test steps. And those test steps contain all of the technical information um, that Tosca is going to have to um, need or it's going to use to steer the application. Um, so how do I create test steps? Um, that's simple. I'm going to open up my module section. Um, and it's, bas it's basically just um, dropping in uh, modules and from the module section. So for example, 
um, top menu. Uh, I'm going to, for example, drag this over into the precondition because in the top menu module, you'll see I have the login button. So I said the first thing I want to do is log in. So I'll drag this into my precondition folder and it automatically becomes a test step. Okay? And now all of the technical information that Tosca needs to steer, the, to click on the login um, link are contained in this test step because of its reference back to the module. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, then the next very important thing is, Melissa told you um, that the modules, and you saw it last time if you were um, participating in our last uh, session, the modules are named according to their contents or the page that they're on. So the top menu um, is obviously on all pages, um, but it, the contents are all links and buttons in the top menu, and hence the name. In the test case section, the name top menu does very little um, to help someone who is looking at your test case to understand what's going on. So you should always, once you, and it's being reused maybe multiple times, so you might click on that top, top menu multiple times, and you want someone to be able to quickly look and see what the difference is between those test steps. So you should always rename the test step according to the actual function of the test step. So in this case, it would be click on login or navigate to login page. Okay? So in this test step, I know that I will be telling Tosca to click on the login link and therefore navigating to the login page. Okay? And um, I would go ahead and drag um, the appropriate test steps into each folder, so the appropriate modules into each folder to make them test steps. Okay? So it would, once all the modules have been created, it's as easy as just dragging them over in the right order. So also, of course, important is for automation, they have to be in the same order as um, the workflow would actually be in the system under test because Tosca will go from beginning to the end of the test case chronologically. Um, one thing I want to mention here is um, that there may be certain things, certain um, series of test steps that uh, you would reuse all the time. So for all of my um, discount code uh, test cases, I'll probably be reusing most of these test steps or series of test steps, and it will only be the verified t discount steps that will vary um, because, okay, verifying one discount or the other discount will be maybe different numbers, different verification steps, um, but lo logging in, ordering the product, checking out, logging out, all of those steps should remain the same. Um, so rather than having to drag and drop modules in each time, um, over and over and over, the same thing, uh, what I can do is use a library. And a library um, can be present on every uh, level of um, in the test case section. And so you can see here there's two libraries, one that's in the in-work folder and one that's in the ready for approval folder. And a library is nothing more than a collection of uh, test step folders that are reusable. So for example, I have a precondition test step folder um, that has already my open the web shop, navigate to login page, and log in test steps. And the values are already there, and everything's already set up for automation. Um, and so that was already created in another test case by another user, and let's say Melissa. She added that folder into my library, and now any user um, you don't have to check out the library. If it's in um, a section that you have access to, you can use the library. Um, and you can just drag and drop those folders into, uh, yeah, these uh, reusable test step blocks, they're called, or reusable um, folders, into your test case. And that carries over all steps and all um, steering information. Um, <clears throat> so, 
rather than, for example, having this preconditioned folder that I created manually, I could delete this folder and instead drag the reusable folder from the library into my test case. Of course, I have to um, put it in the right position. And there I have now all of the um, test steps required um, for the precondition. And uh, I, depending on the, your, uh, your uh, permissions, you may or may not have any rights to change something in the library. Um, but the purpose is, of course, that you wouldn't have to change everything, that everything is um, ready to go. Um, and I can do the same now for all of these folders. And the only one that is unique that I will have to manually create is the Verify Discount folder. So you can see there's an uh, order product. So I could um, get rid of this one and use the library order product. And you'll see when you drag it over, you get this reference. If you hold your mouse over the folder, it tells you that it's a reference to a folder in the library. Okay, so I'm going to do that um, for the rest of these steps here. Okay, so um, that was uh, start checkout. Okay, checkout process. Then there's verify discount, so I leave that there, and confirmation, and of course the post condition as well is. The um, post condition as well is already in the library. Okay. And just like that, I already have a test case that is almost ready to go. It has all of the test steps and all of the values ready to go, with the exception of the verify discount folder, um, which uh, all I would have to do is find the appropriate module. Um, in this case, it's the confirm order module um, because that's where the final cart total appears, which tells you um, all of the shipping costs, discount costs, every uh, discount um, amount, and everything. Drag that in to my verify discount folder. Rename it so it's not now confirming the order in this test step, but it's um, verifying discount calculation. Okay, so it's verifying that the discount is calculated correctly. And the next step for me would be to add the steering values, but this is what we're going to focus on next week. Okay, so um, let me switch back to PowerPoint real fast and then we'll wrap up. In just a minute, we're going to be moving into Q&A time. So if you have questions so far, just add them to the question box. Um, we're going to just do a little bit of a recap for a couple minutes, and then we'll open it up. So enter those in right now, and we'll prepare for them. So I'll just go over these couple slides as a recap what we did today. Um, there was one item, create a test configuration parameter. Sarah, would you mind just covering that just for a minute yeah, in talk, Josh? Sure. Um, okay, so uh, the test configuration parameter, um, once I've created my test case, um, remember I said that this now can uh, indicate the environment or the condition under which I want the test case to be run. Um, so I would actually, while I'm focused on the test case itself, so I could uh, shipping cost discount, I would go to the test configuration tab and I would right click on um, the test case and you see there's a little purple block called create test configuration parameter. So I click on that and um, as mentioned before, um, there are both predefined um, test configuration parameters and you can create your own. Um, we're not going to go into that now, um, but there are, you could check the manual, there's a list of different predefined um, parameters. So you could specify, um, for example, which browser you want this test case to be run in. 
Um, and then the value would be, for example, Internet Explorer. Okay? Um, this is case sensitive, so it's important that you type it exactly as um, it is meant to be how it was predefined. So if you have any questions about what those syntax are, um, you can check that out in the manual. Um, you could also, uh, let's say, do um, Chrome or whatever browser um, you want to set it to. And uh, whenever I um, would be done with my uh, test case, I would, of course, then uh, want to um, move it into my, I would set it to, let's say, completed and move it into my ready folder. Okay, so now it's ready to be um, approved by somebody um, and then I would check it in and whoever else um, needs to approve it would be able to check it out and, and make any changes necessary. Okay? Let me hand it back over to Melissa. Okay, so how to create a test case structure, which she just demonstrated three important points just to um, reiterate what was demonstrated. Number one, create a test case and name it. You have to do this within your folders. Create and name test step folders to contain your test steps, and then you fill them and populate them. And create a test configuration parameter. These three things need to happen before before you get too far into it, it's great to set up your project by doing that, starting off with the TCP and your all your necessary folders. And some of the key points from today, all elements need to be clearly named. Super important. You don't want confusion, especially with multiple people working on the same project. It helps everyone. So determine that per project, per company. So folders are used to organize elements. You've seen today how beneficial they are. Um, test cases follow a clear chronological structure. For example, we saw precondition, workflow, and postcondition. Modules should be named after their contents, and test steps should be named after their function. So here we are. We've made it to the question time and we have a couple questions that, that have been coming into the um, box. If you have some more things, just enter them on in and we'll cover them in the next few minutes. <clears throat> okay, we have one very um, interesting question. Um, it's called, what is the difference between a test configuration parameter and the business parameter? Okay, a test configuration parameter is set on a test case level or higher. So on a test case, on a test case folder, or even on superior test case folders. Um, the value is set there and then can be reused in several places. A business parameter is only used in a test step level, where you have the library, the reusable test step block, and on this level they are used. And you set a specific value only for this test step for this single usage. So a, quickly, a quick differentiation is a business parameter sets a value for a single use and a test configuration parameter sets a value for a general use. Okay, we're just having a look at some more questions to see what else we can cover today. Um, when you, you, when you uh, relocate your test case from the in-work section to the approved section or to the ready-to-approve section, you don't have to copy the library and the reusable test blocks. You just copy the test case. The references will be copied, but the libraries can stay where they are in the in-work section since libraries will always have to be changed and adapted whilst the test cases often might stay exactly the same. Um, we did get a couple questions about specific automation uh, issues. Um, those, we're going to get more into detailed automation, um, adding values to test steps in the next 
uh, session, so the next MOOC, and that's next Wednesday. Um, so maybe uh, we should then go straight into talking about, we can give you a list of the next sessions and um, uh, you give you more information about how to sign up for those. Mm -hmm. So perhaps some of you have already received an invitation like you did for these uh, current MOOCs, one, two, and three. The next upcoming MOOCs, here are the titles. It's going to be November 9th, November 16th, and November 23rd. So, so we have three more coming up, learning to run with test steps, which is going to be a lot of running, a lot of automation, uh, filling in values, actually creating test cases from start to finish. Introduction to requirements, which will be the next one, and you see, you've seen a little bit of requirements today, um, just seeing what they look like, but what are they, how do you create them, how do you determine which ones are the most important and which ones do you test first, that's what we'll be covering quite soon. And then also dynamic expressions and execution lists, we'll be going into that very soon. Um, so you'll be able to see how to execute, how to save all of your results, how to print reports, and getting a little bit more complicated with your values using dynamic expressions. Um, so a lot more useful information coming on up. Okay, we'll just wait a few more minutes for any more questions that come on in. Muted yourself. So um, you might want to check your emails if you've gotten um, anything recently from academy at tricentis.com. You should have gotten the links for the next ones. Um, if not, please send an email directly to academy at tricentis.com. Here I have it written on the next slide. So if you need to contact training, if you haven't received any registration links, just let us know and we'll send you the links and then you can fill them out and you'll get reminders of when they're going to start. We have one more question, it's about do you need to use a library or can you just copy from other test cases? Copying and pasting is possible, but the benefit of using a library is if there's something in your system under test that changes, it can be maintained in one place which would be the library, and it would apply to every test case that uses the reference. So your reusable test step block would be your main place for maintenance. You would go in, change that, um, say some properties of an element changed, and you need to go in and, and just update that, update the module, update the, the test steps. That would be your one place to maintain it, and if it's used 50 times, you would not have to change that step 50 times or 500 times. It would just be applied to all of the references immediately. So that's the benefit. Um, but copy and paste is definitely optional. It's possible. And you can also, um, you can also break the references. And if you need to modify something specific just for one specific test case, um, you could bring in that reusable test step block it would be a reference, and then you can delink those two things, and then you can modify that one thing, and it would be no longer a reference. It would be customized for that test case. Um, we could show that really quickly in Tosca. Um, so, um, how it would look is, uh, let's say, um, here I have uh, a reference, so, um, you know, for example, my, um, uh, let's say, a checkout process, let's say I want to change something in the checkout process. Um, I can't change it here because uh, I have to change it in the library, but if I want to modify this one, I can right-click on this folder. Um, uh, 
or yeah, or if for example during the start checkout I wanted to change the um, uh, discount code that I applied, um, then I would go ahead and click on resolve reference. And now you can see that um, the folder now has lost its little uh, blue um, arrow, this little link, and now these are steps that I could modify in this test case. Okay. Which doesn't affect the library at all. Yeah, so it doesn't affect the library. The um, start checkout uh, folder in the library will stay the same. Um, and any modifications obviously made here will have no effect on the library. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, and important is you can't re-link. So once I've resolved the reference, once I right-click resolve reference, that's it. Now it's no longer... and can no longer be linked to the library. Um, the only way to get it back into the library is either to put this folder in the library or to drag the old one back in, okay? So I can't relink it. Of course, undo, but um, yeah. later on, once I've already saved, I can't uh, undo that, okay? Okay. So I think that's it. We've um, covered the next MOOCs that are coming up. We hope you join us again. It'd be great to have you with us. Um, if you do need more help, if you have more specific questions, we have some contacts right up here on the screen. You can contact support, support at tricentis.com. Contact training, especially if you're interested in the MOOCs and you have not seen the registration links. Just send us an email, academy at tricentis.com. We also have an advanced uh, knowledge base. You can go online, support.tricentis.com, um, and get a ton of information. You can go on and see our online manual. Um, there's just a lot of articles there and information if you, need, if you need to know more, if you want to find out more about Tosca. So you can uh, have all the help that you need. We're here for you, and we're glad that you came today. And... At the moment, there are no more questions, so I think we're just going to wrap it up. Thank you so much for your time. I hope this was helpful, and everyone's going to have awesomely named um, projects from now on. You're going to have great naming conventions, and hopefully some of the tips today were helpful to you and your particular projects. Please, please do the feedback on your way out once you sign out of the webinar, and we'll see you again. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>